Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending to this talk this morning. And thanks also to the sponsors that you can see on the slides that made this work uh, possible. So this work I started uh, several months ago in November uh, 2018 as I uh, applied a, a research university project in uh, our university in Italy. So in our group, we started to work uh, on uh, the eBPF technology several time ago. And uh, at some point last year, we decided to uh, take this new challenge. So try to uh, implement a complex application, network application in uh, eBPF. And um, sooner or later, uh, we decided that that complex application could be uh, IP tables. So the original idea last year was, let's try to implement IP tables uh, using this uh, eBPF technology and see how this works. I mean, if this uh, technology is uh, really ready uh, to go in, in this kind of uh, uh, very complex uh, stuff. Um, IP table was, let's say, by chance, uh, was a choice uh, simply because uh, IP table is known or is considered in some sense uh, having some limitation in terms of throughput performance. Uh, and uh, eBPF uh, uh, with uh, XDP is uh, considered to be very fast. So uh, IP table is considered slow, uh, eBPF is considered fast. Let's put it together and try to see what happens. Uh, so, okay, uh, this talk is about our uh, experience in uh, implementing this uh, uh, right. So, first part of my talk is uh, what we do, uh, what we did so far, in fact. We divided uh, our work uh, in uh, four main challenges, so main, four main uh, objectives. And definitely the first objective is to uh, preserve the IP table semantics. So, uh, the objective is, uh, if the user uh, configures uh, uh, filtering rules in IP table, uh, by the way, IP table for the time being is just filtering rules for us. So we're not considering uh, netting rules. Uh, I, I can uh, tell you a little bit later about netting. So uh, if the user, user con uh, configures a filtering rule, maybe in the input chain, um, we, we have to emulate exactly that behavior with eBPF. So uh, if the user configures the, the rule in the input chain, it means that uh, the traffic that is forwarded by the machine is not affected by that filtering rule. Um, this seems trivial. Uh, unfortunately, the current architecture that we have in eBPF uh, is a, a little bit uh, uh, different from what we have in NetFilter. So as you can see in the slides, there are a lot of paths in uh, NetFilter that take decisions. So the packet comes, go to the NAT, it goes to the routing decision, and then it can cross either the input chain or the forward chain. Um, unfortunately, in eBPF, the hook point, uh, let's consider just the input, uh, because the output is just a specular. So the input uh, uh, hook point is just in front of the internet filter chain. That means that all packets are coming there. So it's not easy, it's not trivial there to distinguish uh, what is going on. Uh, so if the packet will cross the input chain or will cross the, the forward chain. Uh, so that was uh, the main objective, uh, the main point here. And uh, so we had to implement, of course, our code in the eBPF hook, either XDP or TC, doesn't, doesn't measure right now. Uh, but we have to implement this uh, code by a cascade of uh, two blocks. So uh, the packet comes to the uh, TCXDP hook, is uh, intercepted. It goes to a first block that we call uh, ingress chain selector. That is a, a piece of code that is dynamically generated that has to predict whether the packet will cross the ingress chain or the forward chain. The prediction is, in fact, rather simple because, I mean, if the packet is directed to a local destination, which means an IP configured in the root namespace, okay, then the packet is directed to local process, so has to cross the Inger chain. Uh, vice versa, uh, the packet has to cross the forward chain. And, and that's it. So uh, our basic architecture is made by this uh, ingress chain selector that is dynamically created and configured, of course, because 
services. You can add the new interfaces into the system. You can change the IP address uh, that you have in the system. And the ingress change selector has to be updated dynamically in order to emulate uh, the, the behavior of IP tables. And then the ingress change selector, based on the result of the prediction logic, uh, it will forward the packet to the ingress chain on the, or, 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 or the forward chain. Uh, and then from there, it goes again to that filter and then goes to the uh, Linux stack. And obviously, uh, the same thing happens for the packets that crossing uh, the network stack in the other direction uh, that uh, cross the output chain. Um, second objective, uh, key objective, is uh, a fast matching algorithm. And we started saying that the IP table is uh, a little bit slow. And uh, the reason, basically, is that uh, IP tables is using a linear search uh, in, uh, in order to match uh, feature rules. So um, that's an easy way. Um, if you want to compete with a linear search, I mean, there are plenty of options that we can go faster. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not that much easy in eBPF, because uh, the matching algorithm that has to be implemented in eBPF uh, has to undergo, um, according to all, all the, 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 the limitation that the BPF technology has. So for instance, in eBPF, you don't have memory uh, available for you. You have maps available for you, uh, which means maps are structured in memory. So you have to implement an algorithm that can be, uh, that is feasible with the current structure of the maps that are uh, available in uh, uh, eBPF. I just forgot to mention one of the key points of our project that was do not touch the, the Linux kernel. So let's try to implement everything with the vanilla kernel. Um, so the kernel may evolve over time, but we have to uh, take into account this limitation. So um, implementing a new map in uh, eBPF was not an option. Uh, so at the end of the story, we chose, uh, uh, let's say, very old algorithm, uh, matching algorithm that is uh, uh, the linear bit vector search that it is, uh, was presented 20 years ago. Uh, and that uh, divided the matching into a set of uh, matching steps. Each matching step uh, works on a uh, given field um, of, the, of the rules. So in this uh, very simple example, I configure five rules in IP tables, all operating on the input chains. And uh, those rules uh, are checking the value of IP destination address uh, protocol, e either TCP, UDP, or whatever, and the destination port. Okay. Uh, so in this case, we uh, have to arrange a pipeline of three logical blocks, one that is the destination IP, one that operates on the protocol, and the other that uh, operates on, uh, on the destination port. So when a packet comes, is matched first on the des destination IP, and you can see that the the table here has only two values, so uh, wh whatever the, 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 uh, the IP destination address is, uh, it's fine, or it is 10.0008, which uh, 0.0008, which means uh, rule number five. And uh, each table is coupled with a value, so the value of the field that we are interested in, and a bit vector. A bit vector has a size equal to the number of rules, so we have five rules, so we have uh, uh, five bits in the bit vector, and this bit vector has a, a bit at one if the rule is matched with that value. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, if the value is uh, zero, zero, uh, so uh, whatever IP address uh, uh, is, is fine, the matching rules are the first four, and uh, uh, if the value is 10, zero, 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 slash eight, uh, the matching rules are all, because also the fifth rule is, is matched. So. Uh, the algorithm works by steps, so it checks the destination IP, it checks the protocol, and then it puts uh, the results of the bit vector in a bitwise end, and uh, in the end, the bitwise end of all the processing steps give you all the rules that are satisfied. Uh, since rules are uh, configured in order, so the uh, highest priority uh, rule first, the most significant bit in the resulting big vector will give you the, the matching rule. So this is an example. If the packet comes with those parameters, IP destination 10, 1, and blah, blah, and protocol TCP and 10, uh, so in the first step, we'll match the first, uh, um, the, sorry, the, the last uh, value in the table. In the second processing step, it matches the TCP 
disappear, it's, it's in fact disappear. So there are other rules potentially uh, matching, and in the third processing step, it matches the value 80 of the port. Then you can do a bitwise end uh, across all the bit vector, and uh, the most significant bit in the resulting bit vector says that this rule, number one, is the one that matches this packet. Okay, so I just spent a, a little bit of time on, on theory that is 20 years old, but anyway. Um, what is in, uh, interesting at this point is how we implement this algorithm. And we implement this algorithm as a, a cascade of uh, eBPF modules um, made uh, by, in fact, uh, uh, n plus two modules, where n is the number of fields that, th that we are operating uh, on. Uh, so in case we have three fields, like in the previous example, we have three uh, modules that match uh, each field individually plus two additional programs, uh, one at the beginning of the chain that does the e header parsing, like uh, uh, was proposed by before, yesterday, and so on. And the last uh, BPF program, which is the, the, uh, the last of the chain, uh, that basically checks the first bit, uh, most significant bit at one, and checks, in fact, which is the rule that matches. It updates counter, and it implements the action, whether the packet has to be accepted or, 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 or drop it. Uh, so uh, the first message is uh, um, EBF is, is uh, good enough in order to implement even a complex algorithm um, subject to the, the problem that we said before, so uh, that you cannot do whatever you want because of the availability of maps, so data structure. But in terms of cascading on logical blocks, it's pretty good. Um, also, we have to uh, extend a little bit the, the current code in order to facilitate the dynamic creation of those programs and, and connecting those programs together. Because as long as you create a, a simple one program, that's fine. But if you're trying to connect different programs together, uh, it turns out that the code is a little bit difficult to write. So we have to write a library in order to facilitate this uh, dynamic creation of the blocks and linking of the blocks together. Uh, second, um, each eBPF program, so in the pipeline, in the middle of the pipeline, is uh, dynamically created and injected only what is needed. So if we are operating on three fields, we will we'll have a three intermediate block, it, uh, intermediate uh, programs that operate uh, on those three fields. If at some point the user asks uh, me, because it configures another rule that operate on a fourth field, okay, we have to modify the uh, the, um, the pipeline inject a new program that operates on the fourth field that is needed. Uh, th that's uh, nice, uh, at least from my perspective, because it means that the pipeline is dynamically adjusted based on the rules you have. So you don't have processing overhead because uh, you have to support many fields uh, uh, which maybe are not used. Uh, you can dynamically create this pipeline and inject only the programs uh, that are uh, actually needed according to your rules. So three fields, three, pi three, three steps of the pipeline. Five fields, you inject do two, two programs more. And this is dynamically updated, so blocks are added and removed uh, pretty easily. Uh, even more, each step of the pipeline can be customized with the uh, partial matching algorithm that is uh, the best for that field. So um, it, it logically, the algorithm is just a, a matching on, on a field per step, uh, but the algorithm that is used to perform that single matching is not uh, uh, specified. So you can use a uh, uh, lookup uh, like a, a, an hash map, you can use an exact range lookup, you can use a longest prefix match, whatever, and uh, also those algorithms can be changed dynamically. So. Um, based on, on the, the value that you have. If you have maybe two values, like two ports, okay, you can just implement the code like a, a couple of ifs. If a value is x or is y, and that's it. If uh, you have more values, you can implement the code as a map or whatever. So uh, the, the other message is that the uh, dynamic creation of the code and uh, update of the code in the BPF allows you to tune each single processing step based exactly on the rules you have, on the values you have, and you can choose dynamically the uh, sub-algorithm that is best for you in this case. 
Um, other parsing is done at the beginning, I already, already said uh, that. Um, one of the problems we had is that uh, uh, at the end, after the matching in each uh, step, you have to uh, perform a bitwise operation on the bit vector. And the bit vector has size equal to the number of rules uh, uh, that you have. So uh, in our case, uh, we support up to uh, 8K rules, uh, which may be uh, big or, or small, depending on your use case, but I mean, that's uh, the limit we have, simply because in eBPF, uh, we cannot support rule, uh, sorry, loops, so the loop has to be unrolled uh, dynamically, so uh, we generate a lot of code in uh, unrolling the loop, and at some point, uh, we reach another problem, that is the number of uh, uh, instructions is becoming too big, and so the validator in, in eBPF uh, uh, blocks our code, but anyway, 8K, is for the time being uh, reasonable. Uh, this is basically uh, what in the previous uh, slide uh, I called as an input chain or forward chain. So that single block that was uh, uh, depicted in, in blue uh, is in fact uh, a, a cascade of uh, eBPF program dynamically created and updated and so on. So, uh, good or bad of this uh, um, algorithm, I mean, the, 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 the algorithm is not uh, uh, the most important thing. So, the, the algorithm is used in order to go faster, uh, but the algorithm can be changed over time, even if uh, uh, the EBPF is enriched with new type of maps that allow you to uh, implement more sophisticated algorithms. So, uh, let's see as a proof of concept that, that uh, in eBPF we can do complex things and implement uh, complex algorithms, not everything, but complex algorithms. Third objective, connection tracking. Connection tracking is very important. Um, a lot of uh, physical uh, setup um, in IP tables use connection tracking in order to filter, like uh, filter only established, uh, allow only established connection and so on. Uh, so we had to support connection tracking. Unfortunately, the connection tracking that is available in Linux uh, is not available right now in uh, an uh, ABPF program because uh, it's uh, 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 executed in, in a, a net filter and we don't have any helper from a BPF program to get access to that information that is already kept by, by Linux. So we had to implement our own uh, connection tracking. So we implemented a set of models for the connection tracking. Of course, our implementation that is done entirely in eBPF is much more primitive compared to the implementation that we have uh, uh, right now in a filter. And uh, the resulting architecture at this point uh, with the connection tracking is uh, uh, even more complicated. Uh, so just uh, uh, an overview of the overall uh, architecture. So you have the packet that comes, goes into the ingress chain selector, and then has to cross an additional module that is an update session and label packet that is a connection track, the first module of the connection tracking. So when the packet comes into that module, that module understands the packet, uh, uh, so parses the packet, and then uh, it checks whether that packet uh, will trigger a change in the connection table. So maybe it's the first packet of a new session, so you have to create a new entry in the connection table. Uh, second step, uh, always in that block before the ingress, the, 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 the filtering chain, that packet is uh, uh, labeled with the current status of the connection so that the ingress chain or the, the forwarding chain or whatever, the, the filtering chain, can actually filter the packet based on, the, on, on that status based on the connection tracking. Uh, then the packet uh, crosses the filtering chain, of course, uh, and then goes to the second block of the connection tracking, which is called the store session. And uh, that block is basically storing in the connection tracking the ex exact value in case the, uh, the packet changed the value of the connection tracking table because, uh, you know, maybe the packet triggered uh, the, um, the creation of a new entry. Uh, so this second block, at, uh, after the ingress and whatever chain, is just there because uh, uh, we update the connection tra uh, tracking table only if the packet survives the filter. Otherwise, if the packet doesn't survive the filter because it's being dropped by, by, uh, by uh, the filtering chain, uh, we don't have to update uh, the connection tracking because the packet was discarded. So that's the reason we have connection tracking uh, split in two uh, modules, one before 
before and the other after uh, the filtering uh, block, filter blocks, because there are many filtering blocks. Uh, something that is not uh, evident from this slide is that when you enable the connection tracking, in fact, you enable uh, those blocks, so update and store session and so on, on both input and, uh, so, sorry, on both ingress and egress hooks. And the reason is that even if you have filter only maybe on the ingress traffic, the connection tracking has to work on both incoming and ongoing traffic because it has to complete, uh, so follow the TCP stack, uh, um, state machine and so on. So um, in any case, uh, you have to intercept also the packets that are exiting from, uh, from your host. Uh, so this will introduce an additional overhead uh, because of the necessity to intercept packets in, in ingress and uh, egress because of the connection tracking. Uh, limitation, okay, uh, limitation of this approach is that uh, obviously is not uh, as uh, fast and uh, as uh, uh, complete as the Linux kernel implementation. Uh, advantage is that uh, it, it works in eBPF, so that was uh, uh, something that we needed because there were no helpers that allowed to get access to the existing connection tracking. Uh, final objective is to preserve IP table syntax. Uh, preserve IP table syntax is very simple, very stupid. So if the user types something minus A input, minus P, TCP, and so on, we have to uh, guarantee the user exactly the same command line syntax uh, for our clone. Um, there is a problem, though. Uh, the fact that we cannot uh, claim that our clone is 100% uh, compatible with IP tables. Not because of the semantic. The semantic is absolutely guaranteed. The problem are the features. We cannot support right now 100% of the features that are available in uh, uh, EP filter. Um, AP table, sorry. Uh, so our solution has been to create two executable, starting from uh, IP tables uh, uh, source code. So we duplicated the uh, BPF, uh, um, sorry, the IP table source code, and uh, uh, in, as the picture in the, in the picture over there. Um, we called the two executable one IP tables, the vanilla one, and the other uh, BPF IP tables with exactly the same syntax so that the user can choose which one, which executable, uh, executable has, to, uh, has to call. Um, in case the command is supported, BPF IP tables will uh, translate this command internally, so in uh, uh, lib uh, IPTC, intercept the command in, instead of sending the command to the Linux kernel and a true net link, it calls a uh, uh, shell script that calls a REST server, that's an implementation detail, uh, so a REST server that actually implements the BPF IP tables demo, uh, and that implements the control path so that uh, it, it creates all the BPF programs and so on, it, it inject the programs in, uh, in the kernel. So uh, in, in case the command is not supported by uh, BPF or tables, uh, this uh, new executable returns an error and the user can uh, choose whether to start uh, um, send a command with the traditional IP tables executor. So we, we can allow both um, in the same, at the same time in the, in the system. Okay, performance evaluation. So is it really uh, faster or not? So um, of course, um, if you increase the number of rules, uh, you, you can see there till 7,000 rules, you can see that our uh, implementation is uh, definitely faster. That I already said before, uh, it's faster to go faster than a linear search. So I mean, um, what is uh, uh, a little bit uh, interesting here is that, uh, uh, in fact, we're losing a little bit when the number of rules is uh, very small. So we, we have no rules, and when we have few rules in the in the picture I just reported zero and one, uh, IP table is faster. Um, currently we're working on this gap, so we're pretty much confident that we can reduce uh, uh, this gap. Basically there are uh, some lookups in map that can be avoided and some optimization that we, we can do. But the message is that uh, in case the number of rules is limited, uh, we cannot go faster, okay? So, I mean, we are aligned uh, basically with, uh, we probably will be aligned with uh, uh, IP tables. 
Uh, this is the same numbers, but not on uh, uh, UDP traffic. This is for uh, uh, TCP traffic. So we uh, check the number of connections that are currently being forwarded by a, s a client to a server. A server is Apache, so using the traditional Apache benchmark. Um, number of rules in this case is 1,000, just because we tested with 1,000. Uh, you can see uh, an advantage in our implementation BPF IP tables compared to uh, IP tables. Um, the baseline is just mm, no rules, so uh, what we can get in terms of connection per seconds uh, when there are no rules. And the two graphs refer to different page size, so one is minimal page, 87 bytes, and the other is a original page with 11K uh, bytes. Latency. Latency, we are always better than uh, IP tables. Very simple test uh, with two machines, a ping uh, between one machine to the other and then back in order to uh, don't have problems with the timestamp. Uh, uh, we already had a, a, a talk talking about timing. Um, okay, the results confirm that uh, we are always uh, better than the traditional IP table. So at least from the latency perspective, we're good. Okay, future work. I will skip this part because of time concern, but uh, you have this part on the uh, paper and uh, on, the, um, uh, on the slides uh, that I have uh, here. Uh, I will move to the lesson learned. So uh, what we learned from this uh, activity? And the first uh, thing that we learned is that we started uh, our project by, uh, let's say, replacing IP tables, because that's what we had in mind and what uh, we wanted to do in order to validate uh, eBPF. So from our perspective, eBPF is starting to be good enough to implement um, complex application. But if we change a little bit the focus and we say, okay, but what about if we would like to go really in production with a clone of IP tables? Um, is it the right approach? Uh, uh, can we do better than what we did so far? Um, okay, then we can, uh, we, we can have a, a, a little bit of uh, discussion on that. And the biggest problem that we found uh, here is that with the current architecture with the eBPF and NetFilter, so mixing both, um, you are sort of uh, um, take one of them. So you, you cannot mix uh, eBPF, or it's hard to mix eBPF uh, services and NetFilter service for a bunch of reasons. Like, uh, we already said for the connection tracking that is not possible. Uh, so uh, for instance, when we started to think about uh, what about IP tables supporting also NAT, uh, can we use the net of uh, IP filter, uh, sorry, net filter, or do we have to implement our own net? And the answer is we have to implement our own net. So we have to start from scratch, implement a net in IP filter, uh, so in e e e BPF. While the net is there, um, we cannot reuse it. And, and the reason is mainly because uh, there are uh, only a few hooks available. So before and after uh, NetFilter, there are no hooks inside um, uh, NetFilter itself. So uh, it's not possible for us uh, to say, okay, let's replace selectively a component in NetFilter, maybe just the filtering part or maybe just the NAT part, uh, because we have to introduce this uh, um, chain selection logic, so prediction logic, and then and th that's really a nightmare. So, um, the first message I would like to uh, send here is that uh, probably it would be nice to have a, a new set of hooks across all the net filter uh, that can allow to move from, let's say, a competition approach. Uh, you can either choose eBPF or NetFilter, but not both, into a more cooperative approach where you can choose dynamically which component in NetFilter has to be used natively and which other component can be maybe emulated in, uh, in eBPF. Uh, so, for instance, one of uh, the um, reasons we, we feel this may be interesting is that there is no way to get a perfect matching algorithm. Uh, so uh, there are people talking yesterday about uh, a massive number of rule updates per second. Okay, in, in case of our algorithm, it's reasonably faster, uh, but it doesn't support a very fast rule update. Uh, so 
anyway, just, just, just to say that use cases are different and the perfect matching algorithm doesn't exist. This is only on your, your use case. What about if you would like to implement our perfect matching algorithm? Okay, uh, it should be nice at that point to have a net filter with more hooks so that we can just replace that piece of net filter and keep the rest as it is. That is good enough. Okay, uh, so that's an example of uh, more cooperative approach between the two uh, words. Third message is uh, replacing or offloading IP tables. So we started with our orig original goal, let's implement IP tables, blah, blah, blah. So the replacement approach. But uh, if we change a little bit our perspective and uh, we move to this audience that is probably interested in not in eBPF but in other things, uh, we can say that probably it makes also more sense so in, in general in order to investigate for the future, it may make more sense to try to offload part of the IP table rule into a uh, um, ABPF program that is maybe run, executed at the beginning of the chain, maybe even in XDP and so on. I, I think about uh, um, denial of service mitigation, so when, when you have to filter a lot of IP uh, packets based on the source address or, or something like that. So instead of replacing IP tables, it makes sense also to think about offloading part of IP tables into eBPF, which by the way is, uh, to my understanding, uh, uh, in some sense similar to the approach that is taken by the BPF filter that is, uh, came to the, the uh, kernel recently. Connection tracking is a, a good point. Uh, connection tracking is very important uh, and we need more work on the connection tracking and possibly we need more integration with uh, NetFilter because implementing a uh, connection tracking uh, like the one that is already there in eBPF uh, is uh, uh, probably not feasible. Conclusion, I'm uh, here. So uh, this is our work, our ride in the last month. Um, probably 100% compatible version of IP table, so replacement of IP table maybe is not a good uh, idea. Uh, a reduce the first version looks more appealing. Um, EBF is uh, good enough uh, right now to implement a uh, um, rather complex uh, uh, matching algorithm, so that, that's, that's good. Also the pipeline that we can create dynamically can uh, in increase the, the, the performance and allow us to optimize the code dynamically. Um, a better cooperation with uh, uh, Linux uh, uh, net filter in terms of hooks or uh, helper is definitely a good way to explore uh, for the future. And so I'm at the end of the talk. Uh, sorry for not having time for a demo, but I have everything working on my laptop. So if you won't, don't trust me, okay, you can come to my laptop. Uh, I will give you the keyboard. Any of, sorry, Mike. Hello, yeah. Uh, Netfilter people here, Eric, uh, Pablo. Okay, I'm gonna ah, two questions only. None of the Netfilter guys are here. There's Pablo. Okay. All right. Where are you going, Pablo? <laughs> okay. Uh, you next. Two questions only, please. So, f first comment. Great talk, and I agree. I think uh, uh, custom not a custom, but expanding the IP tables hook such that you can run eBPF programs optionally would be the right answer. In fact, I would recommend that we go look and see if you can build an IP tables context for eBPF that's special to IP tables because there's a lot of very common functions that you're going to keep repeating over and over again and we might end up with an unnecessarily large set of helpers if we don't do this correctly, right? Because you're, oh, I need that field, I, I need that particular match. So I think it would be a good thing to think about what that formal interface needs to be. But that's a comment. The question I had was the latency uh, results that you saw for low counts doesn't seem to make sense to me. Like uh, a eBPF program where you're having to duplicate work, which IP tables will benefit from because it's getting pre-parsed packets, for low counts you should have seen higher latency is what I would have expected. Do you have any theory on why the latency was better everywhere? 
Is the uh, question clear? No, no. I have to admit that there is another problem in those results. So those results are, are a little bit uh, uh, higher than what I expected. So having a la latency in a server that is close to one millisecond is too much to me. Um, so the problem is related to the fact that we made the test the last, uh, in the last two days. Uh, I was already here, and I cannot make sure that there are uh, some strange mistakes somewhere. Uh, but anyway, we, we tested both, both uh, software exactly in the same condition. So um, it, to me, it's a, a, an indication that the latency may, may be good in our, uh, in our case. Uh, for the pres precise number, OK, please wait. Uh, we have to refine the work, uh, write a scientific paper, put uh, all the stuff like uh, confidence interval and some more that was not present in this, in, the, in this talk. So we have to make uh, more serious work. So let, let's, let's think about numbers. I'll rather, uh, uh, just case. one okay. quick, Thank qu you. quick comment on the latency measurement. So you may want to look into um, more advanced ways to measure it, like using SuperNet for, for something of like that, because usually we're interested in latency under load, not just ping latency. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll I'll give you a quick comment. Or uh, I wanted to ask about the performance number you presented. Uh, in particular, what did the rule set you were using for the big number of rules, like thousands, look like? My point is, uh, the thing I I realized when you described the algorithm is that essentially you have to check the packet against all rules anytime. In the real life, you want to arrange your rules to handle most of the packets within the first few rules. So like things like local traffic you don't care about or uh, packets in established state and so on. So was your rule set some real life rule set or just random bunch of rules? Okay, G good question. So the rule was uh, the rule set was uh, a set of uh, let's say fake rules operating on uh, IP destination source uh, test port and so on, and uh, uh, last rule let, let's call it de default uh, that was accepting everything, and the traffic was generated in order to match the last rule. Okay, so we're in those conditions. Let's say not probably to realistic condition. Uh, but in, in those conditions in which the last rule uh, was was matched. So probably if you have a, a different mix of rules like the one we said, uh, the, the result may be different. Uh, our problem here is that we may need the cooperation of uh, companies in order to have a, a realistic rule set. That's my, my university, so it's difficult for me to have a, a realistic rule set and see how uh, things are actually working. So I'm really open to any collaboration at this point in order to validate the prototype uh, in a better way. Okay, we, you're not going to get the penalty box, so we're going to allow one more comment question and then, I'm sorry, we're out of time. But. So we do have two rooms that you can book. Uh, they are free, right? Conference room, a smaller one and a big one. You can talk to Fulvia. But uh, Rupa gets the last word. We got a net filter guy. Yeah, just a question. So basically, the development of IP table did stop in 2008 because we are now working on NF table. So it would be interesting to compare the performance of the latest NF table with a decent rule set. And you can even use something like flow table, and then you can compare the performance. So we can have an idea of what you are bringing with uh, the system. Uh, yes, you're completely right. Uh, right. So, uh, of, of course, NF table is one of the, let's say, competitor. Um, but I would like to stress the uh, objective of this project at the beginning. So we didn't want to create the best firewall around. We just wanted to create a, 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 something that was a clone of IP tables in terms of syntax and semantics and so on. So uh, I'm pretty sure that there are best firewalls around, best algorithm, uh, but we have to look at the entire picture. So let's create a clone of IP table so that... I understand uh, your choice okay. of IP table. But what I just meant is that yes. as you are yes. looking at performance, it's useless to compare with something quite old. 
instead of looking at what we can do the best with a current solution on a vanilla kernel. Yes. And your target is vanilla kernel currently. But at that point, uh, the performance should be also checked uh, with uh, a better algorithm. So we choose the linear bit vector search because it was easier uh, to implement. Probably if we move to tuple search or something similar, we can get even better performance. So that, that's uh, so the, 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 the objective was not just pure performance, uh, was just a project that was tried to emulate IP tables uh, with, uh, um, with eBPF. And then there are a lot of improvement we can do uh, or, uh, across the entire architecture. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm just gonna move you, ask you to move off the stage. Just, I'm sorry, not to get rid of you, but there's plenty of time. Uh, just so the, the, the other speaker can get prepared. And I'll give Rupa the last word. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on your uh, question about more hooks. You're constrained by TC, more TC hooks, right? Uh, basically, especially implementing NAT outside of the kernel. I think uh, the constraint, hook constraint has been raised in other contexts before, so there is uh, discussions going on about more hooks because just ingress and egress hook won't help you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that there is consideration for that. Yeah, okay. thank you.